This is going to be Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at some things that happen at salvation. Many times people don't have assurance of salvation because they don't know what took place at their salvation. So maybe this will be a help to someone. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul lets us know that he is an apostle by the will of God, and he wants to let everyone know that he isn't a false apostle, not a false apostle who has transformed himself into a, an apostle of Christ like many men do, but he is a true apostle. And this is dictated, and he, or he is dictating these words to Tychicus in the epistle of Ephesians. And number one, the first thing we see about salvation is that we are made saints at salvation. The moment you got saved, you became a saint of God. Uh, Paul is writing this letter to the saints at Ephesus, as it says in verse 1. Even the worst Christian is a saint in the eyes of God. A saint is someone who is considered holy and close to God. And although you may struggle with sin in the flesh, in the spiritual sense, you are sinless in the eyes of God, in the spiritual sense. And in the Catholic Church, you can't become a saint until after you've been dead at least five years, which is false. But if you are a Bible-believing Christian, then you can see by reading your King James Bible that the Apostle Paul refers to living Ephesians as saints. These Ephesians are alive and well. They haven't been dead. And he calls them saints. But number two, at salvation you become eligible for daily growth of grace and peace. Ephesians 1-2 says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You were able to be saved because of the grace of God. Paul says in Ephesians 2-8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. The moment you believe the gospel, you become at peace with God. Colossians 1.20 says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross. So every saint has peace with God. But every saint still needs a daily dose of grace and peace. We need a daily growth in grace and the peace of God to continue living how we should live. You grow, grow in grace and get peace by reading the words of God and having fellowship with God through prayer. If you look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you get peace of God through prayer. Before you were saved, you couldn't have a growth in grace or peace with God or the peace of God. But you were without hope and an enemy of God. But now that you're saved, you're at peace with God. And you can get the peace of God and have a daily growth in grace. But number three, at salvation, you get spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Paul calls God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this shows that Paul believes in the deity of Christ because any time that someone calls God Jesus' his Father, they are making Jesus equal with God. Man begets man, and God begets God. If God's got a son, his son is God. Any blessing you have comes from this God. If you live a spiritual life, then that's because of God. A spiritual blessing can be something like a love for the Word of God or an, un or an answered prayer. Every answered prayer you get is a spiritual blessing. It is a spiritual blessing if you have a burden for lost souls. Before salvation, you didn't love the words of God, but now you do. Uh, Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings 
in heavenly places in Christ. If you're saved, then you are presently, spiritually sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The things that happen at salvation are spiritual blessings. And number four, at salvation you are chosen. Ephesians 1, 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice that you aren't chosen until you actually get saved. God did it, doesn't choose some and then just damn some. The verse says, chosen us in him. Notice the phrase in him. You're not chosen until you get in. The him in the verse is none other than Jesus Christ. And you're not chosen until you actually get in Christ. And you get in Christ when you believe the gospel, which is done of your own free will. You aren't chosen because you're someone special. You are chosen because you made the right choice and got in Jesus Christ. And God decided before the foundation of the world that anyone who gets in Christ will be chosen. And number five, at salvation, we become holy and without blame. Ephesians 1, 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him. And once you're chosen, you can't be unchosen. Chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Even after salvation, you have a sin nature. Your flesh doesn't get saved and therefore your flesh still desires sin. However, at salvation, your soul is cut loose from your flesh in an operation performed by God himself. And this is the spiritual circumcision of the believer. In Colossians 2.11, it says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So after salvation, your sin isn't applied to your soul like it was before you got saved. Because of that spiritual circumcision, it cut your soul loose from your flesh. So all the sins that you've committed in the flesh weren't applied to your soul. This is how it's possible for you to go to heaven. At salvation, your soul was made holy and without blame because you received the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, meaning God gave you the sinless record of Jesus Christ and took away your sinful record. He took away your sins and the blood of Jesus Christ was applied to your soul. Romans 4.8 says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Uh, God's not imputing sin to you if you're saved. Spiritually, you are as sinless as Jesus Christ, even though your flesh still desires sin and causes you to sin. Your standing in Christ is sinless, while your state is however you are living in the, fl in the flesh at a certain time. Your standing in Christ is sinless. But your state is different. Your state is however you're living at any given moment. But our goal should be to get our state, how we're living at any given moment, to match our standing, which is sinless. And we want to get these two things as close to matching as we can. Your standing is that you are holy and without blame. And your state is however you are living at any given moment. If you're not living how God wants you to live, then your state is not too good. But your standing is still holy and without blame. And that's how you're going to get to heaven no matter what. Number six, at salvation, you are predestinated. And you are predestinated to be holy and without blame. Ephesians 1.5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It was the Lord Jesus Christ's pleasure to die for our sins. The Bible says in Isaiah 53.10, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Notice that Ephesians 1.5 doesn't say you are predestinated to be saved. God didn't force anyone to accept or reject Jesus Christ. When the Bible uses the word predestinated, it never means or says predestinated to salvation. 
here in Ephesians 1 5, it says, predestinated us unto the adoption. God chose from the foundation of the world to adopt anyone who got in Christ. And when you get in Christ, you were predestinated to be adopted. You are now in the family of God. Romans 8.15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of a bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And then Galatians 4.5, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. This adoption is going to make it possible for you to one day get a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. You haven't even reaped all the benefits of your salvation yet. In Romans 8.23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. If you are saved, you are predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son, as it says in Romans 8.29. And we are going to get a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And 2 Corinthians three eighteen says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. But not only are you predestinated to be adopted, but also to obtain an inheritance. Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. There is an inheritance that we can earn, but there is also an inheritance that we get at salvation. The moment you get saved, you are guaranteed a home with Jesus Christ. If you die today as a saved man, you are guaranteed to live with Jesus Christ forever. And if you live right in this sinful world and suffer for Christ, then you will have inheritance in the kingdom. Salvation isn't a reward or an inheritance. It's a free gift. So what we do here isn't to earn salvation. That it has already been settled. You're saved. But the things we do here get, its, get us rewards and an inheritance. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. He's not denying us interest, entrance into heaven. He's not denying us salvation. We presently have it. But if we don't suffer for him and we don't live right, then he will deny our reign with him. Meaning... We're not going to reign over any cities in the millennium. And we'll end up at the judgment seat of Christ without any rewards. So if you suffer with Jesus Christ, then you will have inheritance in the kingdom. If you don't suffer, you still get in the kingdom. You just won't rule over any cities. Uh, there's a false belief going around that the um, unrighteous Christians, the ones who don't live right here, will be cast into outer darkness during the millennium which isn't true. But if you don't live right, you won't have any rewards at the judgment seat of Christ and you won't inherit anything in the millennium. You'll still go in, but you'll just be missing out on what you could have had. But number seven, at salvation we are made accepted. And you can't get unaccepted. Ephesians 1, 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. God should get all the praise and glory for His grace toward us. If it wasn't for His grace, then we wouldn't even have the opportunity to be made accepted in the Beloved. The grace of God has to do with God giving you something you don't deserve. And His mercy has to do with keeping you from something you do deserve. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are accepted by God. If you are rejecting Jesus Christ, then you are under the wrath of God and will face rejection at the great white throne judgment. He will say, Depart from me, I never knew you. And if you are saved, then you have been made accepted in the Beloved. And the Beloved is the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew twelve eighteen says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my Beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. 
Jesus is the beloved, as it says in Matthew twelve eighteen. And God was pleased with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and pleased with his voluntary sacrifice for sin. When we believe on Jesus Christ, putting our trust on him for salvation, we get his righteousness, his righteous record applied to us. And this causes us to be pleasing to God and accepted in the beloved. And number eight, at salvation we receive redemption. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And redemption is a great word, and it means to buy back. At one time you were alive unto God, but when you realized you were a sinner, you became dead in trespasses and sins. Before you realized you were a sinner, you were alive, but then you died. As Romans 7, 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Before a child realizes he is a sinner, he is on his way to heaven. He hasn't reached that age of accountability, as you've heard before. But the moment he realizes he is a sinner in need of a Savior, this puts him in danger of hellfire if he doesn't believe the gospel. And when you believe the gospel, you are then bought back and on your way to heaven again. The Lord Jesus Christ purchases you. Acts 20:28 20, says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the, whole, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Hebrews 9.12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Notice this redemption is eternal and can't be temporal. If you can lose the redemption, then it was never eternal. I heard a holiness preacher say, If you continue in sin, you will need to be re-redeemed. And that makes zero sense. Uh, Ephesians 1 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And this is all according to the riches of his grace. Jesus Christ is rich. Ephesians 2 4 through 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. So Jesus left his riches in heaven to come down as a poor man and die for our sins. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. He became a curse for us. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Uh, Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And moving on, number nine, at salvation, we receive the power to get revelation. Ephesians 1, eight says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, you show prudence when you act out the wisdom God gives you. Proverbs 22, 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Without getting saved, you aren't going to have this wisdom and prudence. You won't have the mysteries made known unto you. And God revealed to Paul a bunch of mysteries that had been hid since the world began, but this was after he was saved. He got some things revealed to him. Ephesians 1, 9 through 10 says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The mystery of his will is that he is going to gather together in one all things in Christ. All born-again believers are gathered together in the body of Christ, we are many members in one body. Then in eternity, the Old Testament saints, church age saints, time of Jacob's trouble saints, and millennial saints will all be gathered together with Christ. And this mystery couldn't be revealed to you if you weren't saved. You really wouldn't get it. 
before you are saved, you can't get any light on the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Someone who isn't saved isn't going to understand the words of God. They're going to have a really hard time understanding the King James Bible, because that's the Word of God. Then, then when you get saved, God opens your eyes, and you can understand it. If you believe his words and don't try to correct them, then he will reveal things to you. It's going to be hard when you first start reading the Bible, even after salvation. But God reveals some things. And I believe in progressive revelation, meaning God will continue to reveal things to his saints through his word. And this isn't like the random YouTube video you see where someone is claiming to have a, a vision from God. The revelation a Christian gets from the Bible will always line up with Scripture and not contradict other Scripture. That way you know it's a true revelation. And the revelation, if it is true, will always be found in the Bible and not in a dream or a vision. Most Christians believe that God randomly stopped giving revelation back with Larkin and Schofield. Yet there are plenty of Christians finding new things in the Bible that God has revealed to them. Uh, God revealed some things to the Apostle Paul that he hadn't yet revealed to others. Uh, Romans 16.25 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And then Ephesians 1.17-19, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him so paul got revelation and if we stay in the book we'll get some revelations god will reveal us stuff get saved and you will get the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him and the best way to get the knowledge of god is to read what the bible says about god the most amazing parts of the bible describe the god who wrote the bible Go through the Bible and write down everything it says about God the Father. And then go through the Bible and write down everything it says about God manifested in the flesh and the Holy Spirit. Have your eyes open to the God you serve and you will have your eyes open to the truth. And verse 18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Get saved and then you can... Get to know the hope of his calling. The hope is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look at 1 Timothy 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is an inheritance that is reserved for every believer. Remember, I said every believer does get an inheritance. 1 Peter 1 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. People always say that it isn't fair for a person to burn in hell for eternity. Well, then it isn't fair for me to have an inheritance waiting for me in heaven that I didn't even earn. It just came along with salvation. Jesus earned it for me. And then verse 19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? The spirit of the one who is all-powerful lives inside of you. God shows us his power in the creation. The Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is no excuse for rejecting Jesus Christ when you can see his mighty power in the creation. If you get saved and in the book, you will see even more of his mighty power. Ephesians 1, 11 through 12 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And as I said before, we were predestinated to obtain an inheritance. The ones who obtain the inheritance are the ones referred to in verse 12 who trust in Christ.
And if you refuse to trust in Christ, then you don't get an inheritance. You get hell when you go to when you die. But with, there is an inheritance that you get automatically when you get saved, and there's inheritance that you have to earn. But number ten at salvation, we get the Holy Spirit. Ephesians one thirteen through fourteen says, "In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation." In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. A lot of well-meaning Christians talk about getting saved and then getting the Holy Ghost later. The Bible lets us know that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you aren't saved, period. Romans 8 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, then you're not a child of God. When do you get the Holy Ghost? As Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, After that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, After that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And Ephesians 1.13 talks about the gospel of your salvation. And that is none other than the gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. And it is the good tidings about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that gospel as your payment for sin, then you will receive the Holy Spirit at that moment. The Holy Spirit of God seals you up and no devil out of hell can break the seal. You are eternally secure. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. God gave you His Spirit to prove to you He was coming back to get you. When you buy a house and give earnest money, you are doing this to show you are serious about going through with the deal. Jesus Christ is serious about saving us, and He gave us the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And God purchased us with His own blood, and when he comes back for us at the translation or the rapture, we get the redemption of our bodies. We get a glorified body just like Jesus Christ. If you're saved, then you have the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead living in your body. Now go down and look at verses 19 through 20 of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. It says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So Paul obviously believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ alone proves that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Anyone who denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a false teacher. If Jesus Christ was a sinner like us, then he would have stayed dead and not resurrected. But he did resurrect, proving he was the sinless Son of God, God manifested in flesh. He arose from the dead and is sitting in heavenly places. And when you got saved, the Holy Spirit quickened you, meaning he made you alive, and he caused you to sit in those same heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And where are these heavenly places? Ephesians 1.21 says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and of every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. God in the third heaven is above every devil, every angel, every world leader, and any superpower under the third heaven is under the God of the Bible. But number 11, at salvation, you get a love for other Christians. Ephesians 1, 15 through 16 says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Before salvation, for most, you couldn't stand being around a Christian. They're always talking about the Bible and witnessing to you. But after you get saved, you have an automatic connection with another Christian, especially those who are Bible believers. I can meet a Christian from another country and right off the bat I know of 66 things that we have in common. We both love Genesis to Revelation. We both believe the Bible. 
I don't talk much, but I can talk for hours to someone who loves the Bible. And this is because I'm saved and I have a love for other Bible believers. We don't need to have this love. or We need to have this love unto all the saints. Even the ones who may be lacking in the Bible believing area. And we need to give thanks for the saints and make mention of them in our prayers as Paul does in verse 16. And number 12, at salvation you are put into the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23 says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head of our all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 17 through 18 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The body is made up of every born-again believer, and there are many local churches in the Bible, but one church, which is his body. There isn't a bunch of little bodies. The local churches are local assemblies of believers, and all the believers from everywhere make up the body of Christ, which is the church. Not the Church of Christ denomination. It isn't a denomination, and it isn't even all Baptists. When it says the churches of Jesus Christ in the Bible, it's not referring to the Church of Christ as they errantly teach. But this has been Ephesians chapter 1, and this has been things that happen at salvation.